thank you all very much for coming. It's, I would say it's a pleasure to be here if I haven't made such a start. Um, it's still a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you very much to Ohad and Katya and James and everybody else for making this happen. Um, could you all please, everyone please put up your hands, raise your hand please, so I can see that you're there. Keep going. Fabulous. Okay, that's great. Now please put down your hands. Okay, thank you. Um, so because I've had this strange systems failure, I am using a backup here. So this is my script for the lecture and this is my GHCI prompt. I assume that you all have Haskell installed and have the package loaded up. Um, who here please does not consider themselves a Haskell wizard? So if you're not a Haskell wizard, put up your hand, please. Okay, put down your hands, please. Thank you for that. Here's another question. Um, who here understands what a monad is? Hands up, please. That's good. Now put your hands down. I actually asked the wrong question. Who here doesn't understand what a monad is? If you don't understand what a monad is, put up your hand. So two people don't get monads. That's absolutely fine. So there are no stupid questions in my lectures. Um, if you don't understand something, remember I'm here for you and um, I'm happy for questions, okay? So don't worry, don't feel self-conscious or anything. Just let it all out, raise up your hand and ask questions. Um, let's talk about lectures. These will be, oh yes, and bear in mind to state the obvious, I can't see you, I can't hear you. So the only way I can interact with you is by you putting up your hand and interacting with me. So you have to be proactive about it. Hands up if you are proactive, please. Oh, that warms my heart, thank you. Okay, hands down, please. Just out of interest, hands up if you're not proactive. <laughs> thank you, Rob. <laughs> Excellent. OK, now, uh, Guillaume, do you have a question? You, I see that you have your hand up. Uh, Mr. Hort, aha. Yes, OK, please. If you have a question, please ask it. OK, um, lectures will be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, the Wednesday lecture will start at 10.45 because your lecture is an idiot. The Thursday and Friday lectures will start on time and your lecture will have restarted his computer and made sure that cut and paste work. Um, I'm also giving a lecture this Thursday at 17.30, that's 5.30 British time, on what is an EUTXO blockchain. You're very welcome to attend that. Um, this is the first time I've delivered this course, so congratulations, you are all guinea pigs. Hands up if you like the idea of being a guinea pig, please. Oh, yes. That, I can't tell if you're smiling, but I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Um, I also don't know how long this material will take. Thank you, David. I like, you know what? Keep those emojis coming because I'm sitting here in this room basically shouting into the void. So smiley faces are very welcome and, and any other faces too. It helps me. Thank you, guys. This really does help me to read the audience. So if you're feeling emotions, express them, including negative ones, because if, if, I, if I know you're feeling sad, then maybe I can help. It depends on the topic. I don't know how long these lectures will take to deliver. Right? And in a sense, I don't care. My main goal is that you'll have some idea of how the nominal data types package is put together. Um, I can see from the um, Slack channels that many of you have been playing with it. That's wonderful. Um, there are some things that, I mean, I was thinking about the data types package. It's reasonably expensive 
extensive and it wouldn't be clear to me how it's put together or indeed where key bits are. There's plenty of design compromises in this package. So I'll just take us through it and we'll see how it goes. And I'm relying on you to give me feedback on how it's going. Um, as I said, it's the first time I'm doing this. So the more information you can give me, the quicker I can iterate and improve. Um, so just to sum up, I want to get you to a stage where you can navigate the code and understand most of the moving parts. And to be clear, I don't know what will be obvious to you. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Um, let's let's get into it. So I'll start by setting the prompt. Set prompt ln. Let's stick with that. OK, I'll set myself some. OK, so let's give ourselves three string labels. OK, that worked. So that's a list of three strings. Uh, yes, Marek, what's your question, please? OK. Hussein, did you have a question? Yeah, hi, Jamie. So um, I, I see you're having trouble. Um, I'm unfortunately not really able to help with that one, but I have a question. <coughs> so you you seem to be um, using stack uh, on one of your um, one of your uh, Haskell files, uh, and I'm not quite sure what you ran so that you got into here. I typed stack GHCI binder. OK. Fine. I'll, I'll be there in a minute. OK, thank you, Hussein. Uh, Marek, you have a question? OK, no problem. So um, now let's look at a command, uh, a function, I should say. Now. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know, um, this is a fairly standard format. Here. So a, um, a type former is traversable when M of A can be traversed like a list. Hands up if that, I'm, I'm going slow to begin with just as a sanity check. Hands up if that makes sense. Good. I'm sorry, I'm asking this the wrong way around. Put your hands down. Hands up if you don't understand what traversable means. OK, so a MA is traversable when it has a first element and given an element, you can go to the next element and so forth. So it might not actually be a list, but it bijects with a list. Does that answer your question, Adam? Adam, raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Alexander, sorry. Thank you. Um, and IO means input output. So um, Fresh Atoms IO will take in a list of stuff and generate a list of, of atoms. OK, and let's do it. So um, atom list at ABC, Fresh Atoms IO label list. Now let's take a look at our new list of atoms. List of atoms. There we are. We have a list of atoms. And they are, let's get used to this now. This is atom number one, atom number two, and atom number three. And they have been freshly baked for us by Fresh Atoms IO. Um, now, I personally find it confusing refer it looking at atoms by their numbers. So I'm just going to create a little function, which I'd really like to cut and paste. Show atom n equals from maybe show n lm 
Oh, I don't have LM index, do I? No, okay, so I need to add data list. Ah, marvelous, what are the A's used for? Sorry, ask that question again, I can't see it. Now, ah, hang on, I need to pop this out. Um, so my, okay, so my question was, what are the A's used for in fresh, in the first argument of fresh attempts? Uh, nothing, or is, is, is just the shape important there? Or? Ah, very good question. So what you're asking is, yes, of course. Great question, thank you. So when I type that, you're asking, what's the point of label list, correct? Yeah, I mean, the, just, yeah, yeah, I mean, just the type of fresh atoms I O is already kind of wonky because it says that the for any A it will give me a collection of atoms. So I yeah. imagine so what you're pointing out that this this type A here actually is thrown away. Um, yeah, th thank you, thank you, Matosh. I, I understand. Um, so here we've used a type A which has not been used on the right. This is just as I understand it, standard best practice in Haskell, um, the user might have a list of n things and they might want an atom for each of those things. So if you have m a's, um, fresh atoms IO will give you, sorry, if you have a list of some a's, then fresh atoms IO will give you a list of atoms, one for each of those things. Um, it just saves you having to count your things, turn them into a unit list or an integer using length, and then feed them into fresh atoms IO. Does that make sense? Yes, that's right, exactly. It's just traverse const fresh atom IO. That's exactly right. Good, thank you. Um, I will carry on. So. Um, I need to go down, I suppose. Let's just write ourselves the show atom n equals from maybe show n lm index n atom list. Uh, my brain scrambled. Oh, thank God, Ohad. Thank you so much. Let's oh, type that right. So, so let's check the type of show atom. There you are. So it takes an atom and returns a string. And this should return a list of atoms. OK, so this is just sugar. OK, let's try a swapping. Oh, Nathan, have you got a question? Nathan, ask your question, please. That was muted. Um, uh, where is it getting the ABC from? Are those chosen like based on the indices, or is it not, in fact, throwing away the um, labels? Sorry, what does, what does it refer to, please? Um, when you run show atom fmap atom list, uh, the show atom presumably is pulling the ABC from somewhere. Are those the labels yeah, or the labels, like, labels. labels around? Yeah, or is, exactly. Is it yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so what oh, show right. atom is doing? You? Yeah, it's traversing. Yeah. It's traversing atom list, finding the atom in it, and um, then <clears throat> if the atom has an index, it's looking up the index in the label list. And if it doesn't, then it just defaults to um, showing showing the um, showing in. So I'll just give myself an extra atom just to see what happens. So D is fresh atom IO. There we are. So show atom C should print C and show atom D will print four. And D has gone through this branch here whereas C went through that branch there. 
Does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you very much. Great question. I've also had a question. What's the meaning of the at ABC syntax? So if we just recall. Um, there. So this is just two. I'm combining an assignment with a pattern match. So atom list here gets um, assigned to the um, result of the IO action. So for each label ABC, we generate a fresh atom and we store that list in atom list. But at the same time, as a nice little shorthand, I've put a bit of pattern matching on to associate A with the first element, B with the second and C with the third. Matthias, yeah, cool. Thank you very much for the quick feedback, Matthias. OK, so now we have this rather wonderful function swap. Hands up if you think you understand what the swappable type class constraint does. Hands up if you think you don't understand what it does. That's what I like to hear. OK, so allow me to explain. A type A is swappable when you can swap in it. Um, and I can probably remind me later to show you the source code because it's quite illuminating. Um, but let's show you it in action. That might give you an idea. Your Tam, you had a question? No, it's I just okay, saying that I don't understand it. <laughs> Thank you, Your Tam. Thank you. Um, so let's try swapping A and B in A. Now, I'm guessing this will give us B, wouldn't you say? So I'll just do a show atom at the front to make it more readable. We're starting simple. Yep, that looking good. And swap A and B and C. I'm guessing will give us C. Let's try swap A and B in atom list. Oh, of course, type issues here. No big deal. There you are. So what swap has done is it swapped A, B, and C. And what's a bit clever about the, the swappable type class is it'll basically distribute down through everything. Ah, and I've made a note to myself here. Look at the swap swappable rules, in particular line 336. So let's do that. Um, here we are. So the swappable type class admits, please ignore the case swap for now. That's not important. It admits a swapping function. And I said to go to line 336. Aha. So swappable um, has some generic magic on it. But this is the key line here. Hmm? that if you have some kind of constructor that takes two parts, then you just swap in the two parts independently. Hands up if that does not make any sense at all, please. Hands up if that, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, well, let me demonstrate. Um, I swap in, let's see, atom list. I'll swap A and B in atom list. So that's fine. But now I'm going to swap A and B in a list of lists, just because I can. So you see what the swapping has done. The swap of A and B has seen this list and applied itself pointwise to the two elements here. And that's exactly what's going on here. This is a generic symbol for anything that takes two things and um, gives you a bigger thing. Does that help your turn? Good, thank you. Um, now I'm going to have to type this thing in. So just atom n Okay, so let's look at the type of just atom. 
This is a function that inputs an atom and maybe returns an atom. So let's try just atom of A. Hands up if you think this should return just A, based on this line here. Thank you, guys. OK, hands down, please. And yes, we remember, remember that A was atom number one, so that's worked. Um, and just atom B should return nothing. Cool. Now let's try this. So just atom primed has the same type as just atom. But what's it going to do? Well, intuitively, we'd expect, who thinks this will return just B? Who thinks it'll return? Aha, uh -huh. thank you, Mateusz. Because we're swapping A and B, right? Who thinks it'll return nothing? Okay, thank you. Let's find out. I'm going to press enter. It returns nothing. So <coughs> what's happening here is um, swapping in functions swaps both on the left hand side and on the right hand side. So by magic, swap A and B in just atoms just swaps A and B in just atoms. So this A here gets turned to a B and this A here also gets turned into a B. So A returns nothing and B returns just two. Um, and I will F map show atom, just atom, find atom list. There you are. And if I do that, so can you see how the A and B, I think this is quite pretty. You can really see how the A and B have got swapped. Um, OK. What should that return? We've swapped A and B in just atom and also in show atom. Hands up if you'd like me to try and run this. Excellent. Thank you. You ready? Let's go. Oh, I forgot to define it. No problem. Let's try again. And just look at that. Mm -hmm. You see? So this command here yeah, it's cool, isn't it? So <laughs> let's just run through this. Show atom just converts atoms into strings. And strings are a nameless data type, right? Strings don't contain atoms. So if I swap A and B in, sing in the string A, I get A. Because the string A is not an atom, it's just a string. It's the same thing as if I write swap A and B in hello world. Hmm? Um, so swap atom primed, if uh, show atom primed here, that will map A, the atom A to the string, sorry, it will map the atom B to the string A and the atom A to the string B and the atom C to the string C. And just atom primed returns just B and nothing otherwise. So that's why we get this. Um, Mr. Swaraj, you have a question. You have your hand up, Swaraj? OK, Hussein, you have a question. Yeah, um, so I was I, I'm, I'm left behind a bit, but I'm catching up. So um, why do you essentially need swappable? Uh, is there any type that is not swappable? That's a very good question, Hussein. Every type is swappable. Um, we have to, because, because names, um, it's a bit like the typable type class. 
Um, so just out of interest, Hussein, do you know do you know how the typeable type class works? No, I don't. Um, I have fine, don't worry. Yes. Um, so the there, there's there's certain kinds of type classes that every type is an element, but you have to tell the compiler in advance that you're going to use it in a certain way. So if we go to, whoops, let's try this, hang on. If we go here, um, the interest if you have swap a bit of swappable um, type class condition is not whether the type is swappable, it's you're activating a machine which will go down through types in a particular way. So um, let's think of an example here. Most um, of this is generic, which what, somewhat what? obscures the point. Hang on, Hussein, hold on. Okay, okay. So these generic rules basically tell you that swappings go down through everything. And the critical line really, as I see it, is this one, which indiscriminately goes down through any type. Uh, let's think of this as a, as a type constructor here. So whatever happens, if you have two things, you just swap point-wise here. Um, there are some types that we know are nameless, and if the, well, they're nameless, then their swapping action is trivial. So here you can see we direct the machine. If a swapping hits a character or an integer or a bool, then anything that ends up here gets directed to this line, which says swapping is the identity. Hold on, please. The same. Are there swappable laws? Are there multiple different implementations of swappable for the same type? No, emphatically no. There is always one correct swapping action on any type, and swapping always does the same thing, which is to distribute. Swapping distribute through structure until it hits atoms. Does that answer your question, David? Thank you. So the canonical example, I'm going to, I'll type it into the screen so you can all see this. Um, I'll just, I need to go left one. So I'm in the GHCI terminal to just type it out. Pi acting on f of x is equal to pi acting on f, pi acting on x. That's it. This will give an error, I don't care. And pi acting on some compound thing um, a1, a2, a3 is always equal to pi acting on a1, pi acting on a2, and pi acting on a3. Uh, yes, that's true. Swappable, uh, to say this, so Hussein has said swappable just gives you structural convenience. Um, as written, I don't fully understand the question, but I think I understand your intent, and you're absolutely right. Swappable is a machine which I have programmed up here, and that machine does something very simple. It always distributes. Hmm? Um, I'll give you another example. Pi acting on a nominal abstraction. This is as in um, Maribel's talk. This has to be pi of A acting on um, pi T. Always. So there was a nice phrase yesterday that the um, the trick with nominal techniques is that there is no trick, right? So swapping is always uniform in this respect, and that's a really important point. Oops. OK, I will continue. So this is quite an interesting function. This is the identity, but written in a stupid way. So identity atom of A equals A, B equals B, C equals C, and otherwise, um, let's see what happens. Thank you, Ohad. I appreciate you trying to help with this. OK, so the type of identity atom. Fine. 
swap a now show atom dot let's see what happens and we get abc so this should be obvious but it's only obvious if you understand that swapping swaps in both the left and in the right of a function call and that's why swapping on identity atom um, has no effect hands up if that's clear please thank you very much that's good so hands up if i can if i can now go on to the next segment and discuss names Good, thank you very much. Ay, ay, ay. So let's talk about names. Name is a function that takes a label and an atom and returns a name labeled with that atom. So um, I'll just give myself a name, name A, A. There you are. So let's just look at the structure here. Recall that the atom A is atom number one. And I have literally just created a tuple that looks just like that. That is the internal structure of a name. Yeah, Nathan, um, that, that, that works perfectly well. Yes, agreed. That's a nice way of looking at it. Here we are. Good, keep the questions coming. So if I swap A and B in this name, I should get B labeled with the string A. Um, yeah, so I'll just try that. Swap A and B in name A, A, A2, yeah. Okay, that, that seems reasonable. Um, if you have any questions, put up your hand, otherwise I will continue. So let's ask a very simple question. If I create, I'm going to create a name A that's labeled with A and is identified, has atomic identity A. And I'm going to ask if it's equal to, who thinks this should return true? Who thinks this should return false? Interesting. Who, who doesn't know? Who's, who's hedging their bets? <laughs> yeah. So it's a design, it's a design choice. So let's see what the designer of this package chose. There you are, it returns true. Why? Well, I'll tell you why I made this design choice. Um, if you think about how names are used, they appear in inductive data types. Now, let's suppose that we want to associate to our atomic identities something that maybe is really difficult to calculate or maybe doesn't have an ORD instance, so we can't, we can't order it. If equality took account of the labels, then any complexity in those labels would infect the behavior of the names. I don't want that. So these labels are purely, if you like, for convenience. <clears throat> the identity of a name is still its atomic identity. So the name here is identified by A here. Um, in the um, there's a saying I remember reading that in the army, you are your record. So the name is its identifier. Any label information is irrelevant. And let's just demonstrate this. Well, I just have, fine. Um, so how about, how about um, this? What should that do? Well, should this return false? Hands up if it should return, sorry, hands up if it should return true. Thank you very much, guys. Trick question, type error, yeah? Exactly. So let's just look at the types. 
that is a name labeled by characters and this name labeled by the unit. Now, you're probably looking at this and asking, hang on, what's that? Well, I'll just tell you now that name is equal to K name Tom. I will explain this later. This is this is one of those design decisions that will come up. Um, hands up if I can carry on, please. Marvellous, thank you very much. Um, hands up if my pacing is OK. OK, thank you. Hands up if you think I'm going a bit too slowly. You're a brave man. OK, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, but if you find me going too fast, then um, do not hesitate to tell me. So um, let's look at this thing here. <laughs> I'm going to create a list of names now. Name list at NA and B and C is equal to uncurry name. So that just makes name take a pair instead of two elements. Label list, atom list. Let's look at our names. Hurrah, good. And now let's try and swap A and B in name list. Now, <clears throat> you should know what's going to happen, right? The strings will remain unchanged because string is a nameless type. That is um, implicit here, right? Chars are nameless, so the swapping action on chars is trivial. And therefore, by distributivity, by pointwise action, the action on a char list will be trivial as well. But we will swap in the atomic identifiers. Bang. Okay, I will take that as understood and continue. Oh, yes, this is quite fun. So I couldn't resist. There's nothing stopping you from labeling a name with things that themselves contain atoms. Oops. So now well, I'll just I'll just show you what it does. There you are. So here, this is the label of the name and this is its identifier. So if I swap A and B in complex name list. Who thinks I should get string? I should get A, one, two. B21 and C33. Hands up, please. Thank you. And who thinks I should get A22, B11, C33? Hands up, please. OK. So the, um, the phrase is always oh, thank you very much. The phrase is always that names distribute, swappings distribute. So the swapping has to go both into the label of the name and onto the identifier. Swappings always distribute. Perfect, thank you so much. Let's continue. Oh yes, so final, final question. What happens if I try to compare NNA with NA? Recall that NNA is they both have the same atomic ID. They're both labeled by the atom A. So what happens when I type that? Hang on, Paolo, I'll come to that in a second. Hands up if I should press enter. Thank you. Type error, <coughs> right? <coughs> so the type system is doing something. The labels are not completely irrelevant. Paolo. What would be bad practice, please? What do you mean? Um, actually, no. If you look at the system F file, um, you'll find that atoms. So um, let's look at a system F term. 
lambda, I'm just making something up as I go along. We could have lambda a of type a dot a applied to a, and I'll just put a lambda here just because I can. Right, so this is, we input a type, and then we input an element A of type capital A, and we apply it to a self. That's, that's not well, well typed, I suppose, but never mind. Or maybe it is. I don't know. Anyway, this thing here, you see that? Do you see that, Paolo? Please type yes. I, thank you. So that thing there, that's a label, isn't it? So the way this is going to be stored, and you'll see that in the system F source code, this is a name. Thank, thank you, Mateusz. Thank you very much. This thing here is a, a name. It's the atom A labeled with capital A. So this is specifically, this is why I created names, so that I could do system F nicely. Paolo, does that answer your question? Perfect. Thank you very much. Good. OK, so on to the next thing, which is abstractions. OK, let's talk about abstractions. So there's this really nice command, browse. You can type this yourself, language nominal abs. Have I not loaded that up? Oh, how interesting. OK, I'll just add it. Wonder if that'll work. OK, I'll exit this and stack GHCI apps. By the way, I apologize for all those invalid magic errors. I used to have this with GHC 8.8, .8, which didn't have those errors, but it would not build on Windows 10. So I'd appreciate brownie points for having spotted this and uh, changed the version. But, you know, you can't win. Then you get then I get these errors. Now um, I'm going to reload my environment. So here are my labels. And maybe I can find that. Done. OK. Cool. We're in business. Let's form an abstraction. Let's just look at the type of abst. <clears throat> so to form an abstraction, we need a name and an element, and then we can form the abstraction of that element by the name. So let's try it. There you are. I have abstracted A in A. Um, who can tell me something rather curious about this expression here? Who sees that something a bit odd has happened? Hands up, please. I'll give you a clue. James, yes, what's odd? Um, if we introduced a, f a fresh um, identifier, like five hasn't come before, right? Yeah. There you are. So thank you, James. Uh, we abstracted something with atomic ID one, and now we've got atomic ID five. So what's happened is when we did the abstraction, the atomic identifier got bound. It's been freshened. 
You see that? James, bang on, well done. Let's try another one. So I predict, I'm not sure, but I predict this will give us B6, B6. Oh, B7, okay. So here we see that abstraction really is it's doing something. Um, morally, abs NBNB is that. But the B is bound, this B here. And we have the label here. Okay, hands up if you have any questions, please. Hands up if I can carry on. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, so, oh, yeah, 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 hang on. Um, say again does it perform any side effects to our uh, to to rename uh, those atoms in abstraction wonderful question Mateo. so um abst is wrapped in an io the side effect is um called when we show it so that's a really really good question actually you get a brownie point Mateo. watch this So each time show is called on abst, um, the machine generates <coughs> fresh fresh identifiers. This is just, I think, because we're in the interactive session. So each time I press return, I end a new state. Does that answer your question, Matej? Uh, yeah. yeah. Marvelous. So, Thank so. you. OK. Um, I'm going to lower your hand. Oh, had yes, question. So, the so far you under the hood to get that to work. So. I can't make the out. Can you say again, please? Sure. Um, you seem to be causing effects on, on, on pure functions in Haskell. So, that means you're using unsafe before IO to get this to work? or, or Oh, well, uh, I... indeed. Um, there, there's unsafe before IO in, inside the system, um, but what I'm saying is that when I type this, I'm, I'm calling a, a show function and show, just if in order to show the atoms, show the bound atom, creates a new identifier for it. Does that answer your question, Ohad? Yes, thanks. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so, um, if I abstract the name A and the name A, and I abstract the name B and the name B, who thinks it will return true? Who thinks it will return false? Yeah, okay, let's try. You ready, guys? It returns false, and this is only because the label list, or is it called Fab's label? I can't remember. Oh, well, I'll find out in a minute. Yeah, so there's a function to get the label of abstraction. I've forgotten what it is, um, but it doesn't matter. We can look at it. It's this thing here. The abstraction remembers the label um, of, of the abstraction. So I'm now going to create a new name list. And these will be trivially, trivially labeled. Oh, OK, I've overwritten my own old name list. That's fine. There we are. So these are trivially labeled names. Actually, I should justify this design decision because it is a design decision. So when I abstract NA in NA, um, this is supposed to look like lambda A of type or labeled with A, A. Do you see? And this is not equal 
to lambda A of type B A. And if we alpha convert this, then we get that. But the labels annotating the names do not change. So the way to think of a name, I think it's quite helpful. I can say it's a, a labeled atom, but perhaps a better way to think of it is a, as a typed atom. But the type is not a Haskell type. The type just comes from uh, you know, um, so this is a, an atom typed with a string. Hands up if that makes sense, please. Thank you very much. And Hussein, thank you for that. Yes. OK, so um, now I have some essentially unlabeled names. Now, if I try the same trick, this should return true, and it does, just because the labels of the names are equal. That's what's going on here. Oh, I've regenerated my names. I see. OK, let's do that then. So Atom, I'm just going to make A, B and C point to um, there we are. So um, this function here which actually may be a confusing name. Anyway, it takes in a name and returns its atom, and there's also name label. Which turn, uh, takes a name and returns its label. <coughs> OK, so let's try to confuse ourselves a bit further. This is intuitively lambda a a equals lambda bb and should return true. Um, what about abs m a m b equals m c m b? Now, let's just convert that into familiar notation. This is a, b equals c, b. So I reckon that should return true. Yeah. And I'll just try something else. I'll try this. And this is a bit like, I reckon that should return false. Yes. Perfect. So this is actually quite interesting, and it's not in my script. Here, I have abstracted NA, which is atom A, in FB, which is the atom B. And all that's happened here is that we've provided the label, um, the string A, to the abstraction. So abstraction just abstracts the atomic identifier and holds on to the label. The same, you have a question? Um, so I do understand the false um, the, the test. The second true one, I don't quite understand. Um, Hang on. Let's just see. Are you talking about this one here? Indeed. Yes. So um, there is there is a capturing of, of bees here that is different, I think. Is that is there not? There's no capture here. We abstract a b. And basically, the identify a vanishes. Oh, oh, okay. I right. I, I got it. I got it wrong the first time. Sorry. Sorry. That's fine. Thank you. Good. Um, Sarah, you had a question. Somebody else put up their hand. Okay, I'll carry on. No problem at all. Nice to know you're there. So let's look at this function here. Let's type it in and see what happens. Wow, what does this do? Let's look at its type. I'm going to ignore the swappable typing condition. Recall, swappability is, in a sense, it's a contentless condition. 
it just switches on it, it warns the haskell compiler um, to switch on the swapping machinery for a so whatever structure a has the swapping action will just plow right through it until it finds atoms and it's the atoms that's all so given an a it returns an abstraction um, by a unit labeled name in that a abst ma ma should then return there you are and this is just abst ma ma it's the same thing we just keep on generating fresh atoms this is let's see what i say about that in a no okay so <clears throat> you may be familiar with the term lambda a dot s right well this isn't a term this is actually a function such that if you give me a term will return lambda abstract a in s hmm? and that's exactly what abst ma is doing Um, so what about, I'll just give myself another function. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'll be, I'll be a bit more idiomatic. Abst MB is just abst applied to MB. Okay, now what's swap A and B in abst MA? So I reckon this has to be abstem B, doesn't it? Because swappings always distribute. So the swapping of A and B is just going to go. Hang on, Mateusz just said normally we would need A fresh. No, 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 not at all. Hang on, Mateusz, I'll be with you in a moment. So let's test this. I claim that this is equal to abstem B. So I will apply this to um, MB. Yeah. Do you see that? You can tell they're the same because the name here, the, the atomic identifier, the atom has got bound here. Whereas if I swap A and B in abstemy and apply it to MA, I actually get you see there's no binding and let's just check the atomic identifier of ma yep it's 18 so this is this okay um mateus you say normally we would need a fresh for s but it gets freshened right uh, i take it you're referring to that s goes to how can i put this No, we don't need anything. S goes to under A S. So if I feed in an A here, then I get an A here. And if I feed in a B here, then I get a B. Does that answer your question, Mateusz? Thank you. Perfect. So we've got 11 minutes left, which is fine. Um, let's just play around with this a bit more. Let's talk about concretion. Let's look at the type of concretion. Mm -hmm. Of course, this this is part of the reason I'm happy to give this course, because someone looking at this would think, goodness me, what on earth does that mean? So I will explain um, by showing you what we'll get to. We'll get to binders later. But abst ma ma conk mb. Let's just look at mb. So if we abstract ma and ma, and then concrete at MB, we get MB. Mm -hmm. Hands up if, if that makes sense.
that's reassuring. Nathan, you might like to switch your microphone off. Um, hands up if this doesn't make sense. Okay, Jeremy, could you please switch on your microphone and explain what there is to be confused about here, please. Hello, Jamie. Jeremy, hello. Good. So, um, I think I don't understand what conk does intuitively, sorry. Absolutely. So what comp does is it takes an abstraction. So if we look at this bit here, thank you for asking. This is the atomic identifier A abstracted in something, MA in this case. Maybe it's somehow clearer if we do this. Right. So what you can see is here we have bound the name 40, the atom 40, in the pair of 40 and 40. And if I concrete this at MB, then this 40 will get turned into 19. Very much like function application, but it uses swappings. Yes, when you say it's like function application, that makes sense to me now. Thank you. No, oh, it's, it's a great question. Um, so this is, this is the essence of nominal abstraction. It behaves like function application, but it only works on fresh names. So let's try this thing here. I predict this should return the pair of MC and MB, which it does. There you see, MC, MB. If I concrete this at MB, then behavior is undefined. I happen to know what this will do, but you're not supposed to do that, right? Don't do what I'm about to do. Just look at MA and MB. So here we can see what's happened is the system has taken MB and applied a swapping of MA and MB throughout here. So the MA has turned into an MB and the MB has turned into an MA. Don't do this. It is naughty to concrete at an atom that's not fresh. So this is fine, and that's fine, and that's bad. Jeremy, does does that does that clarify things somewhat? Yes, thank you. My pleasure. Good. Hussein, you have a question? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Sorry. Um, the, the, the question is, should you not rule out the naughty thing that you just mentioned? Because I think... I it's... can't. I can't. I oh. can't sustain. It's impossible. Can't yeah. be done. Well, so not... there's two reasons for this. There's, sorry to interrupt, but let, let me explain. People keep trying to do this, and uh, that way leads, insan leads to insanity. Um, so... In the mathematics, if you look at the, the original paper on nominal techniques, we say don't concrete an abstraction at a non-fresh name. The problem is calculating what names are fresh is hard and could be undecidable. For example, I can write a little program, lambda um, code, and we output if code terminates, then return A, else B. And thus, if I could decide whether A is fresh for this function applied to some code, then I could solve the halting problem. So don't go there. And certainly the Haskell type system is nowhere near strong enough to keep track of freshness. So as a design decision in this package, I allow the programmer to concrete at anything they want. It's up to you to make sure that you concrete at names that you know are are fresh. Now, fortunately, of course, it's dead simple to generate fresh fresh atoms. I've generated one. I've generated another. I've generated a third one. So you know what, guys? The type system will not track your fresh names, but if you want a fresh name, 
you've got it you can have as many as you like so if you're in any doubt about freshness just call fresh at a myo and carry on the same does that answer your question um well it 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 um this um, uh, library that I don't know, uh, but uh, I, I wonder why it is not possible that you your your fresh Atom IO um, return stuff that you keep track of. So uh, in that way, then then you can you can help the type system to make sure that it will only allow things to be concretized as, as you have tagged them originally. OK, so to answer your question, Fresh Atomio already keeps track of known names. It uses a library called Unique. Um, so in the background of Fresh Atomio is a little counter. It's basically a wrapper for NAT. You can actually see the natural numbers here. So if you're using Fresh Atomio, then you are already doing exactly as described. But that's not the question you asked. The question you, was, you asked was, um, whether in concretion we can enforce that you have to only concrete at fresh names. And no, we don't, and that's really important. You have to be able to concrete at names that are known, but they might be fresh to um, the, um, the, the particular argument. David has asked, is there a dependent typing that prevents that undefined behavior? Um, I actually don't know. I don't know of anything that has become mainstream. Hmm? Um, we are now replaying year three of my PhD, in which, if you look in, in my PhD thesis, there's a whole chapter on trying to, uh, no problem, Hussein, thank you. Um, there's a whole chapter basically on trying to build fresh ML. And the first thing we did was exactly what you're now trying to do, which is to keep track of freshness and to enforce good behavior on freshness um, on the programmer. So if you ever try to do that, um, so to be clear, there's no problem with creating fresh names. That's not the difficulty. The problem is deciding whether A is fresh for S, which is a different problem. If you just want a fresh name, there's a ton of things that will give that to you. The question is, if, if you give me an atom and something that you have built, can we decide whether A is fresh for T? Mathematically, no problem. Computationally, this is a very, very dangerous beast because it has a halting problem um, um, embedded in it. It's like trying to decide whether T terminates. It's the same class of problem. Right, I will just go on for, let's just see what else there is and then we should probably call it a day. Um, Ah, yes. So just one very small point. If we look at the type of swap, it swaps atoms. So there's another function, swap n, which swaps names. Um, and all, all swap n does is call name atom and then combine it with uh, and then call swap. So swap n, ma, mb, ma is going to be equal to swap a, b, ma. Yes. OK, I say we've reached a natural break point. Uh, are there any questions before I wrap up? Nathan, yes, please. Nathan, you need to unmute yourself. Ah, sorry, my microphone is a hardware mute button. I forget it's not wired up to this. Yeah, I hate um, it when people so can't handle I was thinking uh, in like a linear terrible. setting or like uh, Rust or something, you might be able to enforce, oh, well, the name uh, has traveled either to the argument of conch or into the body of abstraction since being used fresh. Um, but uh, yes, not that both. makes sense. Yeah, that, that would, that's a very good point, Nathan. Thank you. I agree with that. If you can track where the names are going, then you could use that to track freshness. I agree. Does that answer your question? Good, thank you. Hussein? Yeah, um, my, my original uh, suggestion was the same, was kind of the same that, that uh, Nathan just said, but the, re uh, the reason why I raised my hand was different. 
I uh, I would be interested in knowing why you wanted to have this library. Um, I suppose that there were uh, some other uh, well, nominal libraries around, and, and you at some point decided that I want my new one. And I, I was wondering why that was. That's a wonderful question, and I should have said this at the start. There are <clears throat> there are other nominal libraries around, and they are referenced in the package itself. If you're aware of a nominal st or any name handling library that I have not referenced, drop me a message on Slack and I'll be more than happy to include a pointer to it in the file. Thank you in advance. So what Hussein has asked was, given that there exists nominal, well, in fact, more generally, name handling libraries already, why create a new one? I will answer that in the next lecture. Thank you, Hussein. Any other questions? Pleasure. OK, perfect. I will hand over to Ohad. Um, thank you very much indeed for your attention.